Um, Ilya Sukar, that's right, right? Yeah, that is right. Um, from from Parse now and now Facebook, and uh, Brett Van oh, Z Zayden Zayden um, from Inc uh, Inc Mobile. Um, could you guys just give a quick introduction? Uh, you know what you're working on, your background. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Michael, for having us here. It's great to be here. Absolutely. Um, Quick background, I actually was at Box for two years, so this is fantastic to be back here. Um, so yeah, quick background about Crashlytics. We started this uh, September 2011, um, right when I left Box, and the goal was to basically figure out why, how our apps were performing. Um, one of the biggest challenges I had actually building apps was you ship it, you really have no idea what goes on after it's in the app store. Once you put it out for real use, um, is the app even working? And so our goal was to build a tool, a very simple, very lightweight SDK that would tell us in real time exactly what was happening with the app, down to the line number of code that any crashes happened on. Um, and so that was actually our product the entire time. So we focused on that, built up the dashboard to sort of give you insight to aggregate, to prioritize all of the crashes coming in, and learned that actually for most apps, if you fix your top handful of crashes, that's really going to be 90% of your stability out in the real world. Um, so our goal was to give you immediately actionable information. And fast forwarding, so we uh, operated for about 18 months independently, and at the end of this January, we were acquired by Twitter. And so we're now, I guess, fully owned and operated by Twitter. Our office is staying in Boston, uh, where we were started. And things are going to All right, uh, my name is Ilya. It's kind of funny, our stories are uh, Pretty similar. We just met today, but uh, I think we have some good uh, lessons to share. Um, so, Parse got started around June of 2011, um, sort of in a similar vein. I was working on various mobile apps and uh, found it really tedious and painful to build an app compared to what it was like in the web age. Um, a lot of the work that goes into being successful on mobile is really not the sort of thing that surfaces to the user and is um, engaging or uh, it's under the hood functionality that stable stakes that everyone needs that doesn't differentiate anyone in the app store. So Parse abstracts that all away. It's primarily you know everything from the data model down to the server and the operations and everything in between. Um, you take care of the user interface. So we're you know some people call us uh, a mobile backend service. I like to think of it as just the next generation platform that folks should build any kind of application on. Uh, focus on the important parts of the application. We'll take care of uh, what it's like to serialize data to and from, uh, you know, Android 2.3 on Verizon and New Jersey. That shouldn't be your core expertise. Um, so similarly, we uh, just exited. We joined Facebook about um, I think it's five weeks ago, uh, physically probably like seven weeks ago in, in writing. Um, yeah, that's that's it. Hi there. Uh, I'm Brett. Can we all hear? Yeah, I'm getting signals to be louder. Good. Okay. Um, so we are Inc. Um, very recently changed the name of the company from FilePicker.io. So if you know us, it's that. You should know us now as Inc. Uh, the, the purpose of what we're trying to do, um, we started about a year ago here, uh, taking a look at how can we help the applications and services that people use work better together. So similarly to Parse, where you know integrating with Box and you know Google Drive and maybe even Dropbox if you I don't know why but uh, <laughs> and all this thing you know that, that's something where you know a lot of users we found really wanted to connect the places where they had content and the applications that were important to them um, into the the applications and services that, that you all were, were building um, and then there really needed to be that sort of connective fabric there that, that tied these things to, together um, and so that's you know where we started especially on the web, um, now we're doing a, a bigger push into the mobile side of things. And you know, people sort of talk to us and are like, oh, are you guys, you know, how do you guys compare yourselves to, to Parse and mobile back into the service? And the way that we sort of draw the analogy is there's sort of the, the, the whole stack underneath your application. Uh, you know, the powers, the, the database and things like that. And what we look at is, you know, want to be sort of the, the connection between your application and the outside world, sort of the, the ring around it, if you will. And, how your app interfaces with others. Uh, so yeah, so we uh, we have not been acquired and uh, still going strong. We're up in uh, San Francisco. And uh, yeah, thank you for having us. Very cool. Um, yeah, so uh, I was hoping to ask you guys some questions about um, 
you know, being, being entrepreneurs in this space and, and also just questions that developers uh, would commonly ask you guys. So let's start off with that, that latter category. Um, so I know one of the, one of the first things that, that we asked Jeff when, when, you, uh, when you approached us with the Crash Analytics uh, idea um, was, you know, how do we know that we can trust this, this application, this SDK, in our application when you're such a small company? Um, how, have you, how have you guys dealt with uh, those kinds of questions about, uh, about trust? And yeah, I don't know. Jeff, if you've got a good, <laughs> please, yeah, go for it. Sure, now it's super important because when it comes down to it with native software, you're actually putting someone else's code into your application. It is running in your application. It has full permissions. It can actually do whatever you want. And so when you step back and think about that, that is terrifying. And we spent a lot of time really working on this because we wanted to ensure every developer could trust us that our code was doing the right thing. And we had an additional challenge because our SDK is actually closed source. So you can't even see what our code is doing. And we, we made that decision because crash analysis is an exceptionally challenging, just technical problem. Uh, to run code when an application has crashed, you, you can't allocate memory, you actually can't call objective C functions. Um, it is incredibly restrictive. And so because of that, our code's down at the level where it's in some places ordering on assembly. And we really didn't want to bother you and have our, all of our developers worldwide start digging into this and trying to make a tweak and changing everything and breaking it. Um, so we figured it was actually far safer for all of these applications if we delivered this closed source. And so, okay, so then how do we get you to trust it? Um, it's a lot of being totally honest and, and frank with developers and deeply technical with them. Because when it comes to working with developers, what we found is you don't want to actually try to persuade them that, oh, like, you could not write this. That's terrible. No developer wants to be in that position. I don't want to be in that position. So it's instead, we have gone to the level of detail where you don't really want to take your time to write this, you have better things to do. And so we were very open on our site with sort of technical specifications of the data we collected down to the variable types, like this is a UN64 that we're sending back, um, to sort of get this level of trust that we knew what we were doing, we were doing it correctly, and that you could believe us that we weren't gonna do something strange with your application. Uh, so I, I think our high level approach was like, let's, let's deeply respect the developers, talk with them on their level, and we were super responsive to support, so if they had a question, we would get right back to them, usually within an hour or two, and I think that starts to gain just a level of human trust, that like, yes, these are real people, they're really trying to help us, and I'll trust them to put code in my hand. Yeah, so yeah, Elia, with, with Parse, it was similar, but, but slightly different, given it's a platform, right? So, right, so yeah. It. yeah, so, so, so I'll echo a lot of those things. For us, it was even more challenging because if you build on parse, you are really you can't really rip it out. Um, uh, you know, later you're really dependent on us, and, and you're trusting us to uh, keep our servers up. You're trusting us to develop the feature set that you're going to need as you grow uh, as a business. And so, um, you know, I'll echo the same things. You have to be very uh, communicative with your developers. You have to be open. You have to like earn their technical trust. Uh, and I think one thing. Uh, maybe we did a little bit differently is, is we just started small. So uh, when we came out the door, we were, you know, our first beta release was, you know, three weeks after incorporation or something like that. And we didn't really pitch it as, hey, you know, build your mission critical next generation game or, or product that's, that your, your, your business can depend on. Just, just play around with it, you know, try it out at home, at night, you know, give it a shot. And I think uh, over time, people started to see that we were continuously executing, improving on the product, um, keeping the servers up, and, and just it was evolving in a way that gained trust. Um, and at some point, people went from okay, I'm playing around with this on weekends, and you know, hacking around and you know, emailing these guys about their silly bug, to okay, my next project could really be built on Parse because it's at a point where I trust the people and I trust the process by which they either fix bugs or develop new features. And so for us, it was very iterative, it was very um, you know, gradual, and I think we're now at a point where there's lots of serious businesses built on parts, like lots of big brands that have trusted us with their entire mobile presence, everyone from Ferrari to Sesame Street to Home Depot. Um, so it takes time, and I think that uh, developers certainly are uh, a tough audience because you know, if you're building a platform, you have to show that you're doing it. Um, you're doing it in a way where they shouldn't have to waste their time thinking about.
about uh, whether you're alive or not. Yeah, just to, to quickly add to that, uh, I think the, the other thing besides being very communicative in terms of a support um, standpoint, there's also a sense of allowing the developer to become comfortable with you on their own without having to necessarily reach out to you. So that's you know, things like having a status page readily available. That's things like you know, being on Stack Overflow and answering questions. The ability for someone to say, you know, just you know, what is this? Is this trustworthy? And not have to you know, pick up the phone and talk to someone, although yes, you know, if you want to provide that, that's fantastic. Um, but you know, establishing yourself where they can find it out and sort of you know, learn to trust it on their own terms. I'll add to that that uh, having a community and like getting that out there early, where you can go to like in our case parts.com and you know see you know in the early days what the toy apps that people are building or nowadays what the serious apps that people have built on parts. Like seeing that there are other people in the community that you can go talk to and you know get their experience with parts and uh, you know get an unbiased like real account of it. Um, getting that out there early, you don't want to have a uh, a web page that doesn't indicate that anyone's actually using your product. So. Start over there. Cool. Actually, I'll add one other thing I just thought about. Um, exciting topic. Yeah, no, this is, this is actually a great question because I think it's so important to the success of your business. One of the things we did is we also recognized that developers very much look to some of the big, well known companies for best practices to use. And so we were very careful in person to actually curate relationships with some of these companies. So Square was one of our early, like, first really big users. And so we knew the engineers there, we talked with them at length, we showed up in person, got them to, to be comfortable shipping us. Again, they shipped the exact same product everyone else did, nothing was different, it was still closed source to them. But they did a really careful analysis of all the data that was transferring and everything. And once we went through that effort with them, yes, it was a big investment of our time, we could then tell everyone else, oh, we passed Square Security Audit, they're shipping us. And that instantly made them comfortable with putting us in their own. And so if you're able to, if you're starting something and able to pick a really tight partner to launch with, I think that's a huge win. Very cool. Um, so co collectively, uh, up here, you guys represent hundreds if not thousands of, uh, of applications that, that use your service, right? And so um, what are some of the, the, the trends that you've seen uh, in applications uh, that, that make them successful? Um, yeah, Brett, do you want to do you other things? I don't know if... Uh, Sure, well, yeah, the, the easy answer is using our products, but uh, <laughs> of course. No, I mean, uh, I think for us, it, it's interesting to watch as ecosystems develop. So it's interesting to watch you know, how we started seeing on our platform, on the web side of things, we can sort of watch the web go from you know, a collection of websites to some of these web applications. So one of the ones I like pointing out uh, is a product called Draft. Uh, drafting.com or something like that. And it really is like a pretty full featured suite for writing content. So for writing whether it's blog posts or anything like that, they have full, it's almost like code reviews type style, like merge changes, things like that. And so for us, it's really interesting to watch, you know, people go from, you know, hey, I need to, you know, upload a profile picture to actually, you know, this is, this is a full file system for my application. Um, so the question was, what makes applications work? Yeah, what, what do you see make uh, applications successful? It's a broad question. We, we yeah. do a lot of kinds of applications. I think of social apps, games, brand apps. I think um, some things that, that really help are just like re-engagement techniques. I think at least in the mobile world, like downloading an app, playing with it for a few minutes, and then relegating it to like the fifth page on your um, iOS home screen it is very common. And getting people back into the app is something that people um, don't think about enough. And things like targeted push notifications, like um, you know, obviously social features, um, all these things like help. And it's really just about the quality of the experience. Like it can't just be um, a one-time use application uh, because that, that in the end is a is a brochure that you download it and it's on your phone. I guess I'd look at this two ways. There's sort of the aspects of your application that get you talked about in the press and sort of in the common mindset or common just daily uh, conversation. And then there's the actual tactics you use to draw people back into the app. And I think together is what makes a very, very effective app. And so on the, on the first front, recently I've seen a lot of 
very cool interaction patterns. And so one of the reasons I think Vine is doing just so insanely well is they is like you just tap and you hold and it records video. Like that was just a really cool interaction that I think caught a lot of people by surprise on how effective it was. And so it gets talked about a lot. Or um, letterpress, where you can like the letters uh, wobble around and move with cool physics. I think these like different types of interactions got them a lot of buzz. And then I totally echo, I saw data recently, I forget where it was, um, that the most effective way to ensure long-term usage, because normally you, you're right, you download an app and the usage plummets after a few days, um, you have to have a push notification strategy. That's the main way to get people back in Europe. Very cool, very cool. Um, moving on towards the kind of more uh, entrepreneur type questions. Um, what is it like selling to uh, to developers? I think they can be a, a hard crowd to, to please. Um, are there any funny stories that you guys have? Um, you know, selling to that crowd instead of you know, box, we, we sell more to uh, to the business type or uh, you know, Facebook is more end users consumers. Yeah, I guess I'll start. Um, so definitely, I would say developers hate being sold to in general. Um, they never want to talk to a person. They never want you to get the sense that you're trying to sell them. And they never want to be put in a position where it seems like they, they need your product because they couldn't build it, which I was sort of talking about earlier. Because the, the innate intent of a developer is like, oh yeah, we could use that, I'll just build a version, it'll be great, it'll take me a weekend, it'll be better. You, you've probably seen this story many, many times. And so our goal was we did zero selling. We actually never hired a salesperson. Um, we hired a developer relations team. And their goal was to go out and actually identify influential developers, um, which are relatively easy to identify on Twitter, build relationships with them, sponsor their blogs. Um, so we sponsored Daring Fireball, we sponsored Marco Armen, uh, we sponsored Sam Sofs. Um, and so they would just actually talk about us on their podcast blogs or whatever it was to other developers. And then the other technique we took is what in the product would convince developers to tweet. So we spent a ton of time uh, on our sort of integration, our onboarding experience, and made it very, very fluid, um, and just got absolutely endless tweets from it, including one from the lead developer of Hipmunk, uh, this awesome guy, Danilo, and he just wrote, oh damn, Parasitics is the very best SDK in the history of the world, and everyone else can go home now. And that tweet just like went wildfire. And when, when developers hear another developer, like just honestly uh, repping something without any like benefit to themselves, I think they trust the product and want to check it out. So that was our goal. Yeah. Uh, so my funny story is that we also had a Danilo moment. Uh, he said something like, Parse removes a gnawing uh, pit of despair in my stomach. And uh, we also had a- Apparently he's very colorful. Yeah, he, he's. If you need a comment uh, for the press, he's great. Um, uh, so I'll echo uh, what uh, what he was just saying. Um, some other things that we did, we did a lot of content marketing. So we spent a lot of time just really um, trying to establish parts of the thought, thought leader in mobile and, and platforms. So we wrote a lot of engaging blog posts. We also just um, wrote, you know, like a ton of tutorials and sample apps and uh, made a, a big deal out of every single launch that we ever put out there, uh, put it all on Hacker News and really um, got the buzz going around our community and, and that helped um, sort of quote unquote sell to developers. The other thing, uh, to, to sort of the same effect, um, you just can't have a gig where, where you have to talk to a salesperson to start using the product. Um, in fact, you should go to the like exact opposite of the spectrum. So we continuously optimize like the time it took from hitting our front page to storing your first piece of data in a parse database. So not just signing up, not just logging in, not just like downloading an SDK, all the way to like when do we capture some data from you from, for your application. And so that flow is something that we can consistently optimize. So it got people hooked because they, they saw some benefit. A lot of times you go to a developer service, uh, it might be easy to sign up, but then there's like 15 steps to set it up and you just don't really have that aha moment and you forget about it and you don't really think about it again. Um, uh, so, so that was something we did. We actually did end up hiring salespeople um, uh, when was this, maybe in October of last year, um, not to really go out and sell outbound because um, like Crashlytics, Parse is very much a product that is bought, not sold. 
Um, we hire these quote unquote salespeople to walk people through when they're their big customer at McDonald's and uh, they've gone through all the fun little developer stuff and now they really want to talk to you about your security practices and you know who has access to your um, servers and, and things like that. So we needed that like human element to walk people through to um, sign big enterprise contracts and, and that worked well for us. Um, you know, if I did the company again, I probably wouldn't even call them salespeople. Um, it's not really selling. Yeah, I think just to, to repeat that, it's sort of the time to first API call is a huge thing for developers. You know, the, the way you put it in terms of, you know, you, you go from seeing the site to when you first start experiencing value from it. And, you know, things that we've done, for instance, you know, making the documentation page have editable, runnable code that you can actually go and play with it and poke at it and say, okay, you know, literally I could take this, copy and paste it, and put it in my application and it would work. Or you know, once someone signs up, being able to just download something that would actually run and work and, and you know, allow you to experience the API, I think is incredibly important. The other thing that's nice about the developer community, I think more so than many others, is that it's a, it's a group of very highly rational people. And so there's a sense of, if you can sort of establish you know, legitimately the best product, it's not, you know, oh, well, I'm more comfortable with this thing. It's like, oh, that's the best thing, yeah, I'm gonna use it. I mean, you look at, you know, for instance, um, Nginx, I think, you know, went from not really being known to being you know, pretty much the world's most dominant server over, you know, in, at least in terms of developer mindshare in a very short amount of time because people said, hey, this is the best, we should use it. Um, and I think you sort of have to leverage that trend, whether that's getting companies like Square to use it, whether that's putting out a lot of content marketing, um, or just even going to hackathons. Very cool. Um, so, right, you're probably, you're, you're the closest this because you just started, uh, right, the think mobile. But um, what made you think about doing a, an app ecosystem play um, rather than building a, a, an, an application? Sure, so for us, it's, it's a lot about, you know, what we really want to do is sort of at the, at the ecosystem level, right? How can we make all the applications and services that you use work together? And for us, you know, when we started, we were looking at, okay, do we make an app? Do we make some sort of aggregation service or things like that? And realized that, you know, if we really wanted to evangelize this, this web of applications, uh, there would have to be, we'd have to be partnering, we'd have to have a relationship with the other applications. And so for us, it was a pretty easy choice. Um, there's also this nice sort of multiplicative effect where you know we, we now have twenty thousand applications on the platform and you you know you look at okay we're we're impacting those applications and the you know thousands of users that each of those have and you get some of these nice you know numbers in the millions of people that you that you can impact on a regular basis. That's very cool. Um, so my decision to start ours is pretty organic. Uh, I was part of a small consumer startup. We got bought by Salesforce. I quit, and I thought I'd do another um, sort of consumer app play. And I tried a variety of experiments, and sort of through this process, realized two things. One, I wasn't that passionate about um, building consumer-facing applications, and I realized that the, there was a need in the market for what I, for what parts eventually became um, sort of the experience of building a bunch of mobile apps on a variety of platforms. Um, you know, doing uh, a bunch of experiments in succession and feeling like I was rebuilding the same thing over and over again kind of struck me as uh, a market opportunity. Um, and, you know, going off of that, I sort of found it attractive that I could uh, potentially start a business where my customers were like myself. And I, I think that um, sort of the, the combination of solving a need that you've discovered yourself and then selling to people like yourself um, makes for a, com excuse me, uh, a compelling startup. Cool. Yeah, truthfully, I never even considered starting an app. Uh, I guess I, I just never really understood consumer. I don't think I'd be terribly good at it. This is the second B2B company I've started. Um, but I think you also need to picture yourself two years in, and the, whatever business you start, you need to love running. So you need to be in a business that you're really going to enjoy the day to day as long as it takes, as long as the business operates. And for me, I've actually, I love developer ecosystems and more specifically the Apple developer ecosystem. I've been building Mac software since the mid 90s. And 
this was actually a chance to sort of get back into that realm and be heavily involved with what was going on at Apple and a bunch of my friends there and so on. And, and it's just a community I love. Um, and so it seemed like a natural fit to jump into this space. Very cool. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, one more question, and then I think we'll open the floor up. So um, just start start thinking about uh, any questions you want to ask these guys. Um, but if, uh, if you guys were to highlight two or three trends uh, in, in technology that you find really fascinating right now, um, you know, what would they be that could be, you know, is it, is it web technology um, versus native app technology? Um, is it, you know, anything interesting happening in the app ecosystem? Um, you know, uh, what, what are some neat things that, uh, that this kind of, this crowd can, can take away um, or maybe look into? Any ideas? <laughs> I don't know. I'll highlight one and maybe we sure. can team answer yeah. this question. <laughs> it's tough one. It's might be too rough. Um, so one thing that's really struck me over the past year is that I think over the past decade, the web engineering world has done incredible work uh, generating really modern processes for software development. So the whole agile movement, continuous integration, continuous deployment, and so on. And mobile really has none of that. And from how I think about it, I think it's actually largely Apple's fault because you have this period of delay from when you submit to when you actually release, which is about a week. And so it, it blocks continuous deployment completely. And if I'm gonna have a week-long block in my release process, well then I need to spend quite a bit of time testing what I'm gonna ship because I don't wanna ship something bad and not be able to fix it for a week. And if I'm gonna spend a lot of time testing, then I have to spend a lot of time building to make it worthwhile to test. Then I have to spend a whole bunch of time planning to figure out what I'm going to build and designing what I'm going to plan. And all of a sudden, you've just literally reinvented waterfall application development. And so I think the biggest interesting trend over the next few years is how do we take mobile development and actually make it agile and fitting into this world. Um, and it'll be really interesting to see whether maybe Android becomes agile and then Apple iOS becomes the platform for your Big Bang release that you've already tested out on Android. I'm really not sure. And so I think that'll be a interesting space to watch closely. Right. It is very cool that Google's just announced all of the A-B testing frameworks, the, the sequential rollout frameworks, and all of that sort of thing. It's super cool. I guess on a pretty similar note, um, I think it's really interesting to see the mobile giants, uh, Apple, Google, Microsoft, really invest heavily in, in like vertical silos, right? They're, they're starting at uh, the sort of mobile operating system, and then these days, a bunch of them are getting into action competing with, with things like Parse and uh, into testing services, into like building their own IDEs, and they're really just building their entire ecosystem top to bottom, I think largely following uh, Apple's footsteps. And I think that this is in some ways great for consumers, in some ways bad for them. It's certainly bad for developers. And um, I think there's a sort of a, a trend of startups and also companies like Facebook who are um, you know, uniquely positioned to provide the glue that's more horizontal, that, that um, uh, allows folks to take their data from uh, one you know, silo and move it to another and to really um, have actual cross-platform applications. I think in the absence of these startups and these neutral parties, um, the world is going into a, a very siloed mode uh, that is very unlike the web. But in good fight. <laughs> Similar thing. Uh, I think that the interesting thing for us is, you know, especially on the mobile side of things and on the web, um, seeing how the, the next generation of applications come about that you know allow people to do productivity type work on the web or on mobile. You know, you go talk to people and they're like, "Oh, I love my iPad." It's like watching Netflix on it. It's like, okay, well, you know, it, uh, I think the way Steve Jobs put it was, that it's a failure of imagination. To, to not believe that there are new paradigms that can happen and new interfaces that can be developed to allow people to use some of these devices in, in really fantastic ways. Um, the other interesting thing that I'm sort of keeping my eye out on, uh, it'll be interesting to see, um, I sort of have a theory that we're moving from a world where it's sort of desktop and or laptop and phone um, to you know iPads are coming in and iPad and phone have a little bit of redundancy. So I'm curious if phones will go by the wayside in terms of wearables, and that you'll get sort of this laptop phone methodology to tablet wearable. Right, we'll see. Yeah, it's lots of different form factors uh, coming out, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I think we should somewhere um, with 
the microphone. So just go ahead and raise your just go ahead and raise your hand and uh, shout or just shout. I guess it's easier. Yeah, go for it. Uh, first, I want to thank you guys for coming and talking to us. You're living the dream. So you know, having built a successful company and uh, and having like such a large user base. Um, what I'm curious about is the journey that took you there. But specifically, I would like to know if you guys have an anecdote of each of you, one incorrect assumption you had about your market um, initially that would have been destructive to the product and to your success, and how you identified that assumption and corrected course, um, either before the matter or before after. Awesome. So, the question was about an incorrect assumption that, that you took, that you made on, on your journey and how you corrected course. Um, so, I think, you know, there's probably a lot of these. So, I'll go with the one that, that comes to mind immediately, and, and maybe it's not the best one. Um, early on, uh, my co founders and I had uh, a lot of debate about whether, uh, whether something like Parse was even viable to some extent. Uh, because we knew that to, to get off the ground, we'd have to start with a pretty simple product, something like you know storing and retrieving uh, structured data from um, from uh, mobile apps. And so uh, we knew in the back of our minds that we would always need to build something like Cloud Code, which is our product. It's, it's a more general runtime that allows you to do basically anything that a uh, Roku or, or to some extent Amazon Web Services lets you do. And so. In the in the early days, we we almost like like abandoned the idea uh, because uh, we thought that there wasn't enough value in just like the simple mobile SDK that abstracts away data storage. Um, so I don't know if this is what you were getting at, but this this is something that um, sort of points to a, a larger sort of startup problem: is um, you don't know until you try, and and, and we almost uh, killed ourselves before. Uh, or even getting out the door. How did you decide to, to stick with it, or what made you uh, kind of go over that hump? Well, yeah, we just put it out there. That's all. Awesome. I think our original bias was to charge for the product too soon. Um, I, I just, because I like sort of B2B software, I've never been a fan of stuff that's like free, always free. I, I want to demonstrate value from what you've built. And I knew we had a product that people were driving value for, so I thought, oh, great, well, let's start charging. And we were thinking, like, oh, we could charge $29 a month, $49 a month, whatever. Um, and we started asking around and getting feedback on it. And yes, there were some people that would pay that, but it would also severely limit our adoption. And we decided, ultimately, to focus on just pure distribution. Like, let's make it largely free. We want every, absolutely everyone to use it. And mobile was accelerating so quickly, and some competitors were coming onto the scene. Um, and fortunately, they went the charging route and started charging $19, $29 a month. Um, and I think that's what allowed us to sort of take the lead in our direct space competitors, because there was no reason not to adopt us. And what we did and learned was that a free product doesn't actually signal or anchor them that it's cheap or not valuable but a $19 price really does. And so any big company is, there's no way they're gonna use a $19 month product. They assume it's for startups or small companies or whatever. And so we totally bifurcated our, our user base and it was either free or it was 2,000 a month. So it was two orders of magnitude more expensive than our competition. And that was fantastic because it immediately means, okay, we're not competing on price. Um, but we but we anchor it to only the really high end people. Our big name apps were paying us, and they felt good about it. They felt like they were getting the best product in the space, and it, it, maybe they would have felt differently otherwise. I guess similarly around pricing, um, one thing that we learned pretty early on, we were sort of uh, we made the classic mistake of charging on cost, not on value. Um, so. Yeah, well, we we originally we took a look when we were going to start you know building out the other tiers and said, well, what does it cost us? Well, we have things like bandwidth costs. It's probably our highest one, so we'll charge people based on bandwidth. Um, and the problem with that is, you know, then you sort of raise all these questions of like, well, what counts? Does it count? You know, are you double counting? How does this compare to this? And you just like the, the number of questions and the amount of intellectual effort that it takes 
for someone to even figure out, you know, how much am I going to, how much is my app going to be charging? Uh, you know, things like, you know, it, I don't know if you, if you build applications, but if I ask, you know, what, how much bandwidth does your application use? So I have no idea. You know, I can run the numbers, I guess, you know, I can give you an estimate. Uh, so we said, no, 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 we're going to charge on a per file basis. You can usually, you know, people have an understanding of, you know, every user does this many a month. Uh, that's when we provide the value. And, you know, in some ways it was a risk uh, because we abstracted a lot of our cost of way. And so there, you know, there are ways that you could use a service that we lose money. But overall, it turned out to be a much simpler model, a much more understandable model, and overall, you know, a more profitable one for us. Awesome. Um, let's see, any other questions? So, perfect. Uh, let's see, how about in the back? Yeah. Right here. Hi. Uh, my question is regarding the business decision. So, how much time do you guys spend in market research, identifying the pricing decisions and the willingness to buy? How much time do you spend in market research for your market? So, the question for everybody else is uh, how much time do you spend in, in market research and um, making the decision set? Pricing and willingness to buy, and, and the willingness of people to, to purchase. I think you know early on the, the advice that we got uh, was, what seems reasonable to you, charge that, uh, and you know, that's sort of what we followed. I think it also helps that you know as when we're selling to developers, we sort of have an internal gut feel of, of willingness to pay things like that. Uh, recently, you know we have some connections back at MIT, and there's some business school students that wanted to run the study for us. And so they did it as a project, and it turned out being, you know, within a handful of dollars of what we set it at. So we felt pretty good. I think, it, you know, at the end of the day, the you know whether you price within, you know, even with even within an order of magnitude, I don't think it's going to have a make or break impact on your business. Um, so. On pricing, we, we had a very organic process. We were in beta for a long time, and we spent a lot of that time just asking people, like, literally, what would you pay for this? And you don't always get the most honest answers. Um, you get more honest answers when you start throwing out prices. And so we just A-B tested a lot of price points. Um, and at one point, we, like, put up pricing on the website and weren't actually charging people. And we gauged people's reaction to that. And uh, we just iterated consistently there. Um, we did a similar thing where we um, were considering a bunch of different pricing models or uh, you know, trying to tie them to like, underlying costs in a very like, uh, tight manner. In the end, of the, we came to the same conclusion that uh, simpler pricing won out, uh, like having greater margins that are sort of abstracted away from the underlying costs was fantastic for us. Um, and so it was, it was very organic. We, we just literally asked a lot of people. Um, but this was in the course of building the product and gaining traction and actually like, validating that the thing was valuable in a binary sense. Um, so I don't think that, at least in our case, we did a ton of market research ahead of time to figure out, you know, is there a market for cars at a certain price point? We started out with, do people actually want any of this? And as people wanted more and more of it, we started to figure out how much they really wanted and how much they paid for it. And you know, what are the segments of, of developers slash like enterprises? Um, you know, how do we move from someone who pays you know zero dollars to someone who pays you know five, ten, fifteen k per month? Yeah, and in terms of competitors, none. Um, so part of the benefit of building a product for yourself is. And in this case, a developer tool is I knew what I wanted to build. And so we expressly instructed our team to completely disregard, not even look at what the competition's doing. And actually, to this day, I couldn't even tell you a feature comparison. I had no idea. Um, in, but in validating the market a lot, and so we talked with a lot of developers and identified that this was a pain point and they needed the product, not necessarily around price. I just wanted to prove out that this was very broadly um, necessary and they would use it. And then what we did on price is so we decided, okay, it'd be completely free except for the really top people. And so the first big deal we were working through, it got to the stage where they were like, okay, so how much do we pay? And we had been sort of punting that down the road um, as long as we could through the conversation because we really wanted them to just be on it and use it and have data in the system and see it and love it and know that they weren't going to take it out. And then we got to the point where we need to give them a price and so we told them 10 grand a month. 
Like, some, we knew something super high that they'd never go for. And then that's how we figure out what their top willingness to pay is. So we start negotiating that down and arrive at 2,000 a month. And we're like, hi, that sounds good. And we've done, like, I think we've gotten you to where you're like, we'll finally say yes to this. And so we started rolling that price out to our other big deals um, and with, with relatively good success. Uh, so we really, we didn't do any formal market validation of, of willingness to pay. It's more trial and error. And same thing, we were in beta for a long time, so it was just conversations and trying things. Very cool. Uh, let's see. All right, how about, yeah, go for a box. So money aside, why did you agree to be acquired or be acquired in the future? You're making an assumption. <laughs> did everybody do that? So the question was, uh, why did you guys decide to, uh, to be acquired? Ah. All right, so um, truthfully, I had zero interest in being acquired. Um, Twitter called us and actually started the conversation pretty amusingly. They were like, so have you guys ever uh, considered working for Twitter? And I was like, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> And maybe I was too blunt with them, I don't know. Um, but no, I, they ended up um, wanting us to come out here with the exact team and, and presenting this very deeply strategic vision of why this was important to them um, and what role we could play within the company. Um, and it just the timing worked very well. We would otherwise be raising a B round this past winter. Um, to raise a B round, we probably would have had to start building out at least a semblance of a business plan and revenue targets and so on. And then once you have revenue, you start being valued on multiples of revenue. So it seems like if we were going to be acquired in the next few years, this was the time to do it, um, which is why we ultimately made the decision to go. Um, but uh, it was heavily conditionalized on the deal. Like we, were, we definitely would not have done it if it meant shutting down the product or changing a lot. And we've been very lucky so far. So we were basically still independent. We're owned and operated by Twitter, but same team, same roadmap, same product, same name, everything. Um, in our case, the short answer is that suck is very convincing. <laughs> uh, but seriously, uh, we were sort of in the same position. We, uh, at the time of acquisition, were around two years old. We had lots of offers, like when we were four people, when we were six people, when we were 12 people, when we were 20 people. Like We had offers along the way, and we turned them all down. Um, and at the time of acquisition, we were actually like considering which term sheet to take for our Series B financing. So we've gone through that exercise of building um, a real business model, hiring salespeople, like ramping up our sales to the point where uh, we got Series B term sheets. Um, and we had gotten to know Facebook over the, these two years in various contexts. You know, they had tried to buy us in the past. We said no. Um, and then we flipped it around on them, and like for, for ages we tried to like get a distribution deal out of them so that you know when you went to like developers.facebook.com, like we had some logo there. And it was in retrospect an uphill battle. Um, uh, so, anyway, we had gotten to know all the principals involved, all the people who built the platform there. Uh, we had gotten to know Mark, um, and they they timed it well. They uh, realized that we were raising money and that it, the time to act was, was then and, and made a convincing pitch for why um, building parts and continuing to run it at Facebook is a lot more interesting than doing it independently. I guess, I guess a quick note here. Uh, you know, it's similar, I think, you know, any startup in the Valley right now is getting acquisition offers. Uh, the, the thing for us that, that we've always felt pretty strongly about is you know, when, when you talk about you know, wanting to, to build this ecosystem and connect these applications together, uh, it, by going and working for any one company, uh, it would sort of seriously inhibit our ability to do so. So similarly to, you know, Parse saying, you know, look, it, you know, Apple wouldn't be able to build a, a product like Parse or, you know, Google wouldn't either. It has to be sort of an independent third party. So that's similarly when we look at it and say, you know, we, we would not be a good fit to go work at Dropbox or Google or any of these companies um, because it would sort of it would prevent us from reaching the, the goals and, and hit the targets that we want to hit in terms of the broader ecosystem. So um, yeah, that's, that's sort of where we're looking at and we're definitely in this for the long haul. Okay, yeah. Uh, in many cases, uh, you have an app that was interaction early on and then sort of dies. 
slowly evolve the class. Mm -hmm. So when you decide when to fill out that and focus on something else, or what metrics would you use to track something like that? I need to mention push notifications to see and then run a lot of A-B testing to see if the changes you're going to have are making an effect, are having an effect on making an impact. But uh, would there be any other decision criteria that you can use to decide whether a product or that is not performing as well as it should? Uh, so, the, so just to, to paraphrase, um, so the question was, at what point what, what metrics would you look at to, uh, to decide whether or not um, an application is, is struggling and, and you should kill it or you should drastically uh, make a change? Yes. Um, yeah. yeah, I think you know, both at the application level and at sort of the feature level, um, it sort of requires a certain amount of intellectual rigor. You have to say, okay, you know, be honest with yourself, it's very easy these days to create for the living dead startup that you just say, well, like, you know, I mean, we can just be, do it for free on parse hosting and you know it doesn't cost us any money and we're making you know hundred dollars a month so why don't we just keep it going I mean you, you sort of have to draw the line and say if we do not hit these metrics and really the metrics depend on what business it is whether that's you know monthly actives whether that's the ratio of daily actives to monthly actives whether that's revenue whatever it is um, both at the app level and at a feature level say if we don't hit this target we're agreeing now that if we don't hit it in the next three weeks or the next six weeks or whatever it is we're going to cut it and then follow through with that. Um, in terms of push notifications, things like that, you would know more. Yeah, I think there's a higher level lesson here. I think for an application or a startup or whatever the hell you're building, um, it's much better to make a small set of users very passionate and happy than a large number go up slowly. So in our case, we just had very passionate um, users from the beginning, and there weren't many of them, to be honest. You know, the, the numbers started small, uh, but they were, they were so passionate and so into what we were building that we believed that um, we were onto something. And so, if I were to start another company, um, I would probably take the same approach. Um, I, I I think there's value in, in setting goals and, 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 and trying to get to certain numbers, but at the very early days, you need to strike a nerve with some subset of people that you think are your target audience and that can one day maybe pay you money, but you just have to strike that nerve. And if you're not getting there, if you don't have people emailing you, if you don't have people pulling feature requests out of you, if you don't have people giving you any feedback, um, and you're just trying to juice the numbers, that, that's a losing game. Yeah, I'd say perhaps specifically I would track daily actives, uh, the ratio of daily actives to monthly actives, and your viral coefficient. So for every user that comes in, how many users are they getting you? Um, and if it's less than one, you have a problem, um, because they'll usually then trail off. Um, but I think the higher level point is right here. I think the most valuable thing in this entire argument is your time. And so either the company's doing well and it's then worth your time, or you're learning a lot and it's worth your time. And if neither of those are the case, then I'd consider diving into something where you're going to learn a lot. Um, and if you feel like you're learning a lot, tweaking things and getting a better understanding of why the growth is where you want, then that's incredibly valuable. Um, because I, I mean, failure is huge. Then you know what to watch out for in the future. Awesome. Well, let's do let's do one more question here. Uh, what's the future of uh, mobile uh, right ones run anywhere? And what's the future of HTML5? So what's the what's the future of write once, run anywhere, and of uh, HTML5 and mobile? This is awesome. I'll go super, uh, yeah, I'll go super quickly. I think maybe we'll get some disagreement. Um, I'm not a big fan of write, write, write once, run anywhere, um, or HTML5 for full apps. Very clearly, for specific bits of functionality, it's highly valuable. For the web, it's highly valuable. Um, so I truthfully believe that any abstraction layer inhibits what you can build on a platform. So by definition, an abstraction layer is not going to take advantage of the full device capabilities. Thus, the best app on that platform is the one that can take advantage of the full device and thus can't be written in an abstraction layer. Um, and so that, I think, is the challenge with mobile web that everyone's hit is like, yes, you can come up with a decent app, but someone's going to be able to outdo you spending more time by writing a native application. Um, and so I think it's a great solution if your company uh, basically requires having a presence on a broad array of platforms and devices, and it can afford to be pretty good. 
versus are you competing on one platform and you need to nail it, then I don't think it's an option to go back up. Yeah, I largely agree. I, I think there's been a, a sort of generation of startups like Accelerator, Sencha, and a bunch of others that, that have tried to build these UI frameworks that are sort of right once run everywhere for uh, at least the UI layer on mobile. And, and, and they, they sort of are good for the class applications just described, but for uh, you know first class, you know, great consumer experiences, they just don't get there. Um, I think there are other kinds of companies like Xamarin that are doing some interesting cross compilation stuff um, from C sharp to all the native environments. I think that's interesting. I think fundamentally, though, um, these sorts of companies will never keep pace with what the uh, giants are putting out in terms of their tool sets and in terms of their operating systems. It's always a game of catch up, um, and it's always a game of how do we uh, avoid the lowest common denominator? Um, and, and, and sort of HTML5, same same issue, right? None of the none of the big guys are really incentivized to make HTML5 um, the right way to build an application, right? They enjoy the fact that they are gatekeepers in their own app stores. They enjoy taking thirty percent very much, right? And who wouldn't? Um, so um, while I think they're doing better in making it possible. Just I, I I doubt anyone at Apple is 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 invested or compensated based on the experience of HTML5 web apps in Safari right now. Um, rather, they're um, you know focused on making their app store uh, the best it can be, and, and the same goes for uh, Google and Microsoft. I think the, the interesting thing here, I'll sort of agree and then offer another interesting take, which is. Uh, the, the place where we've seen, and you know, we've talked to the folks at Accelerator, you know, because they are actually doing reasonably well in the enterprise. So they'll go to companies who want to spin up, I think Best Buy was building you know, 60 applications that are all single purpose you know, for a given salesperson in a given scenario. They're not consumer apps, they don't need to be the highest quality, but they need a bunch of them, and they need it on every platform, and they need it now. Um, and so in that case, it's really interesting to see the adoption of some of these tools um, there. It may even be a similar sort of path that, that we've seen with Java, and sort of Java being this, this really big enterprise language that we see the same sort of write once, run everywhere type paradigm in the enterprise side of things, but not something meant for high performance, you know, highly native experiences. Um, you know, the, I was reading something recently you look at some of the stuff that came out on iOS 7, and you know we're not going to see that sort of some of the you know, the, the physics-based UIs and things like that. Like we're not going to see that on the web for three or four years, if that. Uh, and so you know, it's trying to even keep up with the native platforms on the web. I think it's a losing game. All right. Um, well, thanks for coming, guys. Thank everybody here for thanks everybody here for coming. Um, hope you enjoyed the, the dinner and the talk. And I think I don't know. Can you guys hang out for a little bit to to chat with people? Um, so if you have any other questions, uh, please come up. And uh, yeah, thanks again for coming.